that song. Be turning to Mark chapter 2. So when we enter into this text, whenever we're reading the gospel of Mark as we're going to be preaching through it the rest of the year, keep in mind that Mark has an audience in mind as he is writing the text, which I think would be Roman believers who are beginning to suffer some persecution at the hand of Nero, and that's going to grow. He also was a companion of Peter, who according to his epistle, probably was in Rome as well. But he also is giving a story of Jesus, and the characters within the story of Jesus are these Jewish individuals, along with the disciples who couldn't quite figure out who Jesus is. And so here in the book of Mark, there's a complex process of hearing a text. The text wasn't written directly to us, but it is direct implication for us. But we have to understand and unpack it as we go through this. So we're going to be listening to these stories and trying to figure out how the original audience read them. What was happening with these disciples? How does it speak to us today and how do we make that interpretive move for us to gather what God continues to say through the power of these texts? So that's what I bring to the moment, and uh, it is frightening, but exciting. So a few days later, this is after he healed the leper, Jesus again enters Chapernachum. That's how you really say the word. The village of consolation, Capernaum. Probably, probably the hometown of Peter. There was a large synagogue there. Excavations have shown that there were two synagogues built on top of each other at different times in history, not at the same time, one a two-story synagogue. Okay, that, that really was... <laughs> And very near to the synagogue was a very large house. And some suggest that this was none other than Peter's house, who happened to be married. He had a mother-in-law. Um, and so Peter was, you know, established in this city or this village, which was a fairly large village. So the people had heard that he had come home. Now, this may be the base of operation for Jesus now, right in the, the shadow of, of Herod Antipas himself. It wasn't that he was running away after John was taken into captivity or jail, but he was setting up work right here in the shadow of where the power structure is and saying the kingdom has come. Now, you think about that. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. One of these days, I may experience that. Not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Oh, I wish I I could have heard Jesus preach. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, Carried by four of them. Now, we often say the four friends. There were more than just four, apparently. There was a whole group of them, and four of them were carrying him. I wonder wonder why. Have you ever thought about that? Seems like there's this group of folks carrying this paralyzed man. Now, we're not told exactly why or when this person was paralyzed. I do know in this particular area, there's a lot of construction going on. This is why there are a lot of withered hands around. It could have been that this was a construction accident. And any of you who have ever done construction, you can appreciate how tenuous that can be. You can fall off a ladder. You can fall off a roof. You can have all kinds of accidents that can leave you disabled. Maybe this was a construction crew. Or maybe it was a group of family We don't know exactly, but here was a man carried by a group of men, specifically four of them had each corner of his cot, and they bring him to Jesus. 
But since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, now as an introvert, if I come in, there's a crowd, I go, well, I'll go somewhere else for a while. I'm, I'm not a crowd kind of guy. I've been at places before when someone has spoken, he's somewhat of a celebrity, everybody's wanting to see them. I go, I'm, 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 I'm good. I saw him up on the stage. I'm good. But this wasn't that. I'm sure he's glad. I'm glad you weren't one of my friends. They made an opening in the roof above. Now, this wasn't the 21st century home where they get out a ladder and they take him up there and they saw the, the plywood and destroy it. No, no, no. This is tile roof. You put them aside and sometimes there's some mud that they put in there for insulation. You kind of dig it out. And they lowered the man on the mat. When Jesus saw whose faith? There? Who is there? It's not a trick question. The friend's faith. Perhaps the man is well. He may have been included in it, but it was the collective reality. It's fascinating to me that there was a connection between what's going to happen here and not merely the faith of the individual, because he is not specifically mentioned, but their faith. Jesus said, notice he didn't say you're healed, he said your sins are forgiven. Now that's strange. What is the connection between sin and physical ailment? This text seems to link the two. But what I love about the Bible is that the Bible is much more nuanced and complex than that. We, in our particularly Western mind, where we like to have things black and white, we like to know what's, what, the, what the reality is all the time and can be predictable. There's something I found out about God as I read Scripture. The only predictable thing about God is that God is unpredictable. Amen. And some texts link Sin with ailment. Others distance it completely. The book of Job is all about that. Sometimes you suffer and you have physical ailment precisely because you're being faithful. Now go figure that one out. So we have to be careful. The text tells us to step back and be careful about our judgment. Because after all, we are not God. And the sooner we get that right, the much more free we can live. Son, your sins are forgiven. Okay. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves. I often, often thought, man, you know, if I were like Jesus where I could uh, really hear what people were thinking, I'd love that. And then I realized, ooh, <laughs> what a burden that would be. Thinking to themselves. Now, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And in fact, they were exactly right about who can forgive sins but God alone. Amen. <laughs> That's the whole point. They were right. Now, they were wrong about the blaspheming because if this is God at work, then he's not blaspheming. He's simply doing what God does. Amen. And so Jesus then says in verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, now why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say this paralyzed man, your, or to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Now, uh, clearly the word say here is used metaphorically. Anybody can say anything. But the point is, which one is easier to accomplish? Amen. I mean... If by the power of God you are doing miraculous healings and exorcisms, as we saw in chapter 1, then what about the forgiveness of sins? Yeah, there are those who were not divine who healed, but it wasn't them. We even saw that in our text this morning in the Acts class that Peter said, it's not by our power, but by the power of God within. But Jesus says, your sons are forgiven. Take up, get up, take your mat and walk. Walk. Which one is easier to say? 
But I want you to know that the Son of Man, Hoheus Hotheu, this is, this is that phrase, Son of Man, that, most, that many scholars would say this is Jesus identifying fully with humanity, which it is, but it really, the background of this is Daniel chapter 7 where one like the Son of Man came in the clouds. Now, notice he wasn't coming from the clouds. He was going to the Ancient of Days in the clouds. This was the ascension, not the descension. And so he comes to the Ancient of Days, and he's given all authority and all power and all dominion and all nations worshipped him. So Son of Man... This phrase from Daniel chapter 7 refers to his deity Amen. as much as his humanity. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen. Hmm. First shocking story. Once again, in a synagogue, Jesus does something that is amazing. Now, there's another shock in this text. Because in verse 13, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. Now, we have a little different venue, but not far from Capernaum. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Here we have none other than Matthew. One who was a tax collector working for the Romans in this area of Galilee that was known for its Torah observance and its resistance to imperial Rome. Not only the Pharisees emphasized the Torah as the means by which to overcome Hellenism and Romanism, but there also were many zealots in this area. Gamla wasn't far away, a hotbed of zealot activity. And here you have a tax collector who was a traitor, extracting more tax from his people than they should have, pocketing the overage and sending the rest to Rome. And the tax collectors were so hated that they were simply grouped in this, this, this category of tax collectors and sinners. Okay. So Jesus, one who was involved in this activity, he did not say first, um, repent, get his life right, and then you can come be my disciple. Does he? He says, follow me. And he leaves his tax collecting booth and follows Jesus. Amen. And we sit here and go, what would compel anybody to do that? Well, we weren't first century Jews. And for a rabbi to invite you to follow him, as we've said before, was a great honor. And this tax collector was a tax collector because he was not the creme de la creme. He didn't pass Torah school to go to the next level. He was going about his, his work, even a shady type work. And here's this rabbi says, why don't you come follow me? And he does. Levi got up, followed him. And then we're not told what happens between verses 14 and 15, but apparently Matthew says, hey, Jesus, I'm hosting a party tonight. Want to come? Some of my friends are coming over. Love for them to be around you. And Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners. I think I would qualify for that group. We're eating with him and his disciples. Now you get the mixture of this. You have Jesus at a traitor's house with sinners. 
You can just let your imagination go on that one. And his disciples were there. I wonder what the disciples were thinking. There were many who followed him. Oh, now verse 16. But when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, I am so glad that we're not like this today. They ask his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Remember eating? Eating isn't just satisfying the natural hunger pains of the body. This is fellowship. This is sitting at table. This is demonstrating a sense of acceptance and belonging. It's a legitimate question for those of us who are of polite religious society. What about the optics here? The optics just don't look right here. Jesus should have been distancing himself because, after all, we are called to holiness. May I suggest that Jesus had not forgotten that he is holy God? Amen. And I have learned something in my 62-plus years of life that the only people with whom a holy God can deal are with unholy people. Amen. That should be good news for you. Amen. Uh, because I need to remind you, you're, you're sinners. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came today to get this good news? Amen. You're just a broken mess of people like me. What's the difference? The difference is that the Holy God has taken up residence among us, and it doesn't mean that somehow we're more morally or spiritually superior. It's just that we have grabbed hold of the only one who is. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> and that's such good news. And he sits with us. And he says, because you're at my table, something can happen now. So why are you eating with them? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, Here's a proverb that they knew. It's not to the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If he came to call the righteous, there would be nobody to call. Really. Amen. There are two types of people, I think, in this world. Sinners and those who realize it. And those who realize it possibly can be the righteous, not by their own ability, but by that imputed to them by Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, can anybody else say amen? Thank you, Mike. Can you get the, can I get a, I know if I have to ask for it, it doesn't, it doesn't count, but can I get a witness on this? I think sometimes we have this notion that somehow if I, I have, the only way I can go to church is if I get a little bit better than most people. No, oh, you've heard the old phrase that church is not a country club for those who are all buttoned up and zipped up. It's a hospital for the sick. Amen. And I like that. Though I think that analogy breaks down at some point, but my goodness. I have come not to call righteous, but sinners. So I, the way I deal with this is I, I think about this text all week, and it starts fomenting in my mind then it starts infecting me in a holy agitation of a way. And I start thinking about what is this text saying to me? I wonder how the audience heard it. What's going on in the text and what, what's being confronted, what's being exposed in my own heart. And so once again, I'm going to share four things with you very quickly that I think are kingdom reminders because the kingdom of God has come out of this text. And the first one, you're going to go, well, duh. But I think we need to hear this. I needed to hear this. These episodes emphasize that sin is a real and sustained issue for humans. It seems that we are in a societal plateau at the moment in which we don't really like the, the language of sin. 
that just seems too, well, judgmental. Maybe we have some issues and brokenness is an appropriate way of describing it. But sin, let's... But what does Jesus do? Son, your sins are forgiven. I'm eating with sinners. Sin is this real and sustained issue for humans. And Jesus does not simply dismiss this reality with his kingdom message. His kingdom message is coming. I have come to save. I have come to bring healing and to give power because sin, while it does involve wrong action, it is both a disease and a power over you. Amen. And I have come. I have come to give something fresh and new and liberating. And so this is what the gospel is dealing with. This is what the kingdom message is about. And number two, I think about this, while we may legitimately wrestle with a complex relationship between sin, there's a lot on these slides. You know, I was just thinking through this and I was typing it and I said, there, this is just too much on a slide. And so I left it. <laughs> while we may legitimately wrestle with a complex relationship between sin and physical ailments, Jesus came to bring complete redemption, both physical and spiritual. And so while we want to think about, well, what, what is all that? The kingdom of God has come to make all things new. Amen. That's why at the ultimate consummation of the ages, there's going to be a bodily resurrection. Amen. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, the entire creation that is groaning will be brought to redemption as well. God is both concerned about the physical reality as well as the spiritual reality, and he's going to make it all new. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth in which dwells righteousness. I long for that day. That's what, that's what we're seeing in the gospel. When the kingdom comes, you're starting to see the fragmented self being brought to shalom, wholeness, wellness, integration. For heaven and earth are now once fully married again as God intended them to be. Amen. So that's what I've been thinking about here. What about you? Number three, the faith of the unnamed men who brought the paralytic to Jesus should not be overlooked. One's faith in Christ compels us to bring others into his healing presence. Amen. Did that one fall flat? I just, I just started thinking about this. It's, um, it's not, a, it's not a, a probe toward evangelism or door knocking and those kinds of things. You used to do that all the time. Jewel mill or film strips, raise your hand. <laughs> Y'all have no clue what I'm talking about. One Sunday, we need to show some Jewel Miller film strips where you get the ding, ding, and you turn the slide. <laughs> and there, I think there were five of those things. So about an hour apiece, ding, two, and there's a narrator taking you through the story. Not bad information, it's just a little misguided. And then the knocking on the door. I, you know, I don't know if we're in that society much anymore, but used to go door knocking, and I remember I was with this one guy. He was very zealous, and we were in this city. We were knocking on the door, and he was getting a little more frustrated. And he, someone came to the door, he said, do you realize that if you died today, you'd probably go to hell? <laughs> Which prompted the person on the other side of the door to invite us to go first. <laughs> I said, she threw you on the creek on that. I'm not getting into that one. <laughs> but there is something compelling about in Jesus there is such depth. There, there, is, there is a beauty of recognizing what it means to be human and how the holiness of God finds expression in the power of God taking up residence among tax collectors and sinners and bringing about transformation. I want people to experience that. It's not about giving them a new system of thought. I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's, it's introducing them to the real source of life. It's saying, can you come to life 
and stop pursuing death. That's the real distinction in Scripture, life and death. We tend to talk about heaven and hell, but it's ultimately life and death. Do you want to live or do you want to live toward death? And Jesus is the source of life. I have two more very full slides. But if not careful, I was thinking about this. Religious folk can become more committed to protocol than to people. And people are the real purpose of genuine religion. Amen. We may forget that. I remember when I was a baby preacher and trying to do things right, you know, because Sunday morning, everything evolved around Sunday morning, and you got to get that right. And as a preacher, it's like, i got to make sure all my points are well argued. And if it's not a good point, just raise your voice. <laughs> It'll sound better. And I was getting nervous. I had my double-breasted suit on and my, my bow tie back in the day. Yeah, I was a sight. And someone, at the wrong time, I'm here to tell you, not during the invitation song, before the invitation song, right as I got up to preach, walked up and interrupted me and said, I just need some prayer right now. Well, it was not the appropriate time for prayer because that would disrupt the order of service. And so I motioned for some of the shepherds, and we said, well, look, at the right time, we'll pray over you at the end of the sermon. And they said, that was very well done. And I have repented of that. Amen. Oh, my Lord. Now, if you want to interrupt me, no, let's just leave that. <laughs> if God moves your heart for prayer, don't be waiting for this next sermon. Don't, don't be waiting for this next slide, rather, because it's a sermon on the slide. Come on now. Oops, somebody's standing up in the... Oh, oh he's just going to the restroom, y'all. <laughs> it's okay. Seriously, this isn't about me. This isn't about doing the right thing in the right way. This is, this is God we're talking about. You are participating at this moment. And look, feel free to interrupt this at any time. And that's risky. But we need, to be, we need to be more committed to people than to protocol. Jesus did that with a leper. Pure religion and undefiled before God, says James, is to do what? Take care of the widows and orphans. And keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's what pure religion is about. And too often I think religion can have exactly the opposite intention that God intends. Religion is not bad. It's a, it's a form of ritual. The word for religion means worshiping God through ritual acts. There's nothing wrong with that. Taking the Lord's Supper. Singing, praying, those kinds of things that we do collectively are not ends of themselves. They're ushering us into the one who loves us more than life itself. Amen. And it causes us to think about others and to recognize that we're a part of this beautiful kingdom community in which we're starting to see the move of God in a way that we see each other differently in our world differently. And finally, i got to finish with this. Jesus recognizes that we, sinners, rather than needing moral correction, require divine presence, which leads to transformation. This is a great slide right here. We need healing rather than a system of self-improvement. That's what I'm getting. It's not that uh, we don't need to worry about our morals. No, no, no. It's just that if you, try, you, can, you can do behavioral modification and still have the problem. Jesus wants to get to the real issue, dig down deep into the soul. Those experiences, those trauma that have created such difficulties within us. 
and finds expression in such negative ways, he wants to bring his shalom and healing there. To release us from addiction, to release us from the nurturing of our own anger and hurt toward those injustices that have been occurred in our life so that we can have freedom, freedom, and freedom. Amen. It's interesting to me that we even have self-help books. It seems to be a logical contradiction there. If it's self-help, then why in the world do you need to go read a book? Because the reading of a self-help book is by definition helping you. I mean, the self-help section ought to be empty if it's real self-help. In other words, we recognize that self-help is a myth, else there wouldn't be self-help books Amen. and seminars. God knows this. And so why not allow the creator of who we are to be the one who comes and brings the healing? The kingdom of God and the gospel message isn't get your life right. It's that Jesus comes and in the presence of sinners, in the presence of tax collectors and of lepers, he touches and he eats. And by his divine presence, there is incremental perhaps, but true transformation. That's why the process of Jesus isn't believe the right things, get your life right, behave correctly, and then you can come and belong with me. It's no. You belong. Let's just party together. Amen. And then you start seeing something about me and you start coming to belief. Then all of a sudden you, you become more than you could be. I want to be a church that has a reputation like that. That's the Jesus way. And it's messy. And there are, uh, uh, there are critics who will say, can you believe? I hope that people are criticizing Crossbridge for loving on the wrong people. Amen. Because that's what Jesus is criticized for. Not so they can stay in their brokenness and in our brokenness, but so that we can become more than we otherwise could be. Can we be a place like that? Because the kingdom of God has come near.